Sup, peeps. So I wanted to address a subject of concern today for a lot of hair loss sufferers, and that is whether or not minoxidil, either the topical or oral variant, can contribute to any kind of cardiovascular problems. Now, minoxidil doesn't need any introduction. It was the first treatment approved by the FDA for the treatment of male pattern baldness way back in 1988 under the trade name of Rogaine, uh, which is in the USA, or Regain in the United Kingdom or the European Union. It was initially just available as a 2% solution, but later in 1997, a 5% variation was made available for men, with a 2% variation marketed towards women primarily, although plenty of women do use 5% minoxidil with no issues. Also, as of recently, it came to my attention that Rogaine has been marketing a 5% once per day minoxidil foam for women, so I feel the usage of 2% minoxidil will be relegated only for people who are sensitive to the drug and want to start with a weaker concentration just to kind of test the waters a little bit and see if there are good responders to it. But fortunately, uh, since 1996, the drug has been over-the-counter, and it's widely available in most regions of the world without prescription. And today, the drug is off-patent, so cheaper generic brands of minoxidil are available. For instance, I get mine from Target for just $20 US dollars for uh, three one-month supply bottles, and that's a pretty good deal. And I think if you go on Amazon.com, you can buy it even cheaper, especially if you look at the Kirkland brand, which I think is like $20 for a four-month supply. So I think that's probably uh, the best deal right there, just as long as you don't mind ordering by mail. Now... Getting back on subject, it's important to remember that minoxidil, strictly speaking, doesn't treat androgenic alopecia. What it is, is that it's a hair growth stimulant. It doesn't go after the underlying cause of androgenic alopecia, which is androgens like DHT, dehydro, or excuse me, I meant dihydrotestosterone. Uh, it doesn't stop dihydrotestosterone from destroying the hair follicle. It will, however, promote hair growth, but since you're still going to have the androgens destroying the scalp, minoxidil is widely considered to be an ineffective standalone treatment for long-term use. Fortunately, we also have my favorite treatment, which is finasteride. And as many of you probably already know, finasteride is a 5A reductase inhibitor, which stops the conversion of testosterone into DHT and thus lowers the amount of DHT on the scalp. So, Ever since finasteride was first FDA approved in 1992, using a combination therapy of finasteride alongside a growth stimulant like minoxidil has been a common recommendation from dermatologists to patients to treat male pattern baldness. There have been other growth stimulants that have been released on the market since uh, minoxidil was initially unveiled. There's things like stamoxidine, uh, adenogen, adenogen, which is adenosine, and also redensil, but none of them have as much research or have proven to be as effective as minoxidil, hence why the good old minoxidil and finasteride stack is still to this day considered the gold standard in fighting male pattern baldness from a pharmaceutical perspective. However, long before minoxidil was used as a topical hair growth stimulant, it was used also as a last resort anti-hypertensive medication uh, in its oral form known as lonatin. Its hair growth properties were only discovered by accident when patients reported hair growth on their scalp as well as all over the body as minoxidil affects any hair it is applied to, not just those adversely affected by androgens such as in the case with finasteride. So in 1979, after decades of research, the Upjohn company, which also later released Rogaine, uh, released Lonatin, which is the, which like I said, is the oral version of minoxidil and is used as an antihypertensive drug. Now, the oral version has never been FDA approved for hair loss, but people who use it have still nevertheless reported pretty remarkable hair growth on par, if not superior to the topical variation, which has prompted many people to experiment with the oral drug itself. As much as I understand the temptation to have a superior and more convenient version of minoxidil in the form of a pill, I cannot and will not ever, rec ever recommend this to any of my viewers. And here are some of the reasons why. First of all, if you just look at the oral minoxidil package insert, it comes with a quote, boxed warning. Boxed warnings are not there for the patient, but rather they are there for the doctor and they're used to advise doctors of some very serious side effects. Now, in the medical and pharmaceutical community, the words very serious side effects has a specific meaning. It means that it has side effects that could potentially threaten the life of the user. The reason why such a drug would even exist on the market to begin with is that it would have to be determined that there are at least some usages where the benefits outweigh the risk. And in the case of lonatin, oral minoxidil, that case 
cases of someone has severe hypertension and they don't respond well to other drugs. So just going over some of the adverse effects one could experience on oral minoxidil, these include acute myocardial infarction, which is just a fancy way of saying heart attack, angina, which is chest pain from the heart and an early warning sign of a heart attack, and also cardiac tamponade, which is a fluid around the heart that can cause the heart to stop bumping blood and kill you. The most common side effect of lodotin, however, though, is something called orthostatic hypotension. What this is, is an extreme drop of blood pressure when you are standing up. People can pass out as a result of this, which can cause potentially fatal head injuries or can cause bone fractures. So because of all these problems, if a patient is approved for oral minoxidil, it has to be started in the hospital under cardiovascular monitoring. It certainly isn't a drug someone should just pick up from the gray market and try playing Russian roulette with because they read about some dumbasses trying it out from a Reddit post. In real life, oral minoxidil is very rarely used by doctors as there are much better and safer drugs available today to treat hypertension like uh, ACE inhibitors and also beta blockers. The advent of these newer, safer anti-hypertensive drugs have made oral minoxidil pretty obscure nowadays. So since the dangers of oral minoxidil are so well established, should we be concerned about topical minoxidil causing similar cardiovascular problems as its oral counterpart? Well, the first thing to keep in mind about topical minoxidil is that it is not well absorbed in the skin, and thus the concentration of minoxidil in topical minoxidil is pretty high in order for the drug to effectively reach the hair follicle. So to give you an example, a single milliliter of 5% minoxidil has 50 milligrams of minoxidil. Uh, in comparison, a lonatin tablet has 5 or 10 milligrams of minoxidil. So compared to oral minoxidil, topical minoxidil's concentration of the active ingredient is remarkably high. However, like I said, very little gets absorbed through the skin, only about 2% or so. So if you are using one milliliter of 5% minoxidil on the scalp, that equates to one milligram worth of systemic absorption. So given this, is this small amount of systemic absorption clinically significant enough to cause cardiovascular health problems in the same way oral minoxidil can? Well, you have to keep in mind when evaluating how strong a drug is, it's not just an issue of dosage, it's also an issue of how it is absorbed. So yes, even though you will get roughly one milligram of minoxidil absorbed systemically when you apply one milliliter of topical minoxidil on the scalp. That doesn't mean it's going to be the same as, say, cutting a five milligram tablet of lonatin into one milligram slices and then just taking a one milligram dose of oral minoxidil. When you take something orally, it is absorbed much more rapidly. You can kind of think of it like, uh, you know, applying a nicotine patch versus drinking pure nicotine. A nicotine a patch, when applied to the skin, will release the nicotine very gradually and the blood levels of nicotine will remain low over the course of several hours to all day. If you drink liquid nicotine, however, even if it's in the same amount as you find in the patch, it will enter into the bloodstream very rapidly and you'll get a big peak of the drug and potentially toxic levels that could put your life immediately at danger. So, the same applies true to minoxidil when applied to the skin. The one milligram will enter the blood into the bloodstream gradually, whereas if you take one milligram tablet orally, it will enter the bloodstream very quickly and possibly put you at a greater risk of causing a large drop in blood pressure. But Nevertheless, people have expressed concern about topical minoxidil causing adverse cardiovascular side effects, so let's go ahead and take a look at some of the research available and see if it holds up to scrutiny. So. During the initial clinical trials, which uh, led to the drug's eventual FDA approval in 1988 as the uh, drug Rogaine, it did not show any significant decreases in blood pressure with topical minoxidil amongst any of the subjects. Now, regarding some other potential cardiac effects, though, there was another interesting study done the same year in 1988, which I'll link below, that addressed uh, this question. The study was a double-blind, randomized control trial that looked at 2% topical minoxidil, because keep in mind, back in 1988, 2% minoxidil was the only kind available. But anyways, they took the 2% minoxidil and they compared it to a placebo control group. Both groups got one milliliter of topical solution twice per day for six months. Now, before beginning the treatment, there was a cardiovascular exam, including an echocardiogram, which is basically just an ultrasound of the heart. And this was repeated at the three-month and the six-month mark to measure progress in both of the groups. So, 
Getting to the results of the study, there were 20 men on minoxidil and 15 men on placebo. Now, keep in mind, back that uh, back then in 1988, when uh, minoxidil was first FDA approved, it was only FDA approved for men, and that's why there were only men in the group and not women. But anyways, the results showed that there was no difference in blood pressure between uh, people taking the placebo versus the minoxidil group. So this shows that not much minoxidil was getting into the bloodstream because oral minoxidil is a very powerful blood pressure lowering medication. Uh, they did find that there was a borderline uh, increase in heart rate for people on minoxidil during standing. This was an increase of four beats per minute, but the p-value was exactly 0.05. And what this means normally is that a p-value needs to be below 0.05 in order to be considered statistically significant. So that means there is a possibility this outcome was due just to chance. Also, it's worth mentioning that four beats per minute is pretty negligible, especially if you consider that the normal normal human heart rate is only is, is about 60 to 100 beats per minute. So let's go ahead and take a look at the echocardiogram findings. The study found that the cardiac output, which is how much blood the heart bumps uh, every minute, was very slightly increased on minoxidil, and it was also slightly decreased on the placebo, uh, which is pretty interesting considering it's supposed to be an antihypertensive medication. But anyways, this was a very small change, and it's difficult to interpret, especially since at baseline before anyone received minoxidil, there was quite a difference in cardiac output between the groups which is typical since such factors can be influenced by things like lifestyle and genetics. You know, for instance, we don't know which of these guys were smokers or how much exercise or how good or poor their diets were. So this is not a very good marker to go by. So the bottom line is that at worst, there were some very, very minimal cardiac effects, which are probably not clinically significant with topical minoxidil. And surprisingly, this is the only randomized control trial I could find on the cardiac effects of topical minoxidil. And I say it's surprising because cardiovascular disease is the most heavily researched illness in the world. Looking at the literature uh, further than this, there are some rare case reports uh, of individuals having some problems on topical minoxidil. Uh, for example, uh, there was a study brought to my attention by one of my viewers, in fact, that in 2008, there was a case report published of a 42-year-old male who started getting blurred vision in his left eye. It turns out he was on a high dose of 5% minoxidil using twice the recommended dose. He eventually stopped the minoxidil and his vision subsequently improved. When he had the blurred vision, he went to the ophthalmologist and was found to have a disorder called, and give me a moment because this one just rolls right off the tongue, non-arteritic anterior ischemic optic neuropathy. This isn't actually a cardiovascular problem, but the investigators felt that it may have been related to his use of topical minoxidil. Of course, I must emphasize again, this is just a case study, and he was taking a higher than recommended dose. He was taking double the recommended dose, in fact. So his case cannot be common, or else we would have seen many other uh, reports of people uh, having bad health effects. I mean, especially considering that the drug is over-the-counter and it's been over-the-counter for many, many years now. And in fact, given the many clinic, uh, years of clinical experience with this drug, it appears to be remarkably safe, judging by the lack of serious adverse effects found in the medical literature. I mean, even if you compare topical minoxidil to something else over-the-counter like Tylenol, which we all know as a pain medication, Tylenol actually has far more reported cases of liver failure and even death, which is why it is not available without a prescription in some parts parts of the world like France. I mean, as far as I know, I don't think anyone has ever uh, died from using topical minoxidil. But nevertheless, because of the cardiac effects of oral minoxidil, I would still recommend that if you do have a history of heart disease or, you know, have a lot of risk factors for heart disease, such as being a smoker, having a sedentary lifestyle, hypertension, diabetes, or you have a strong family history of heart disease, you should probably check with a doctor before starting topical minoxidil. I mean, chances are your doctor will say it's okay, but better safe than sorry, right? So that's all I really wanted to say about this. I mean, just keep in mind, I am not a medical doctor, so this should not be interpreted as anything more than just me disseminating some of the available research on minoxidil rather than medical advice. Uh, nevertheless, please don't ask me about oral minoxidil for hair loss. I mean, you're not under any circumstances going to convince me that it's okay to recommend it. I mean, the last thing I want is to have people's blood on my hand, which could very well happen if somebody dies as a result of following recommendations I make. So that being said, I hope you did find the video informative and I will see you guys next time. Take care.